So I think uh, we're entering into the, the final last discussion uh, or session of our event. And I think it's been really, really, really great. And there's thanks so much to all the speakers because ultimately that's what this is. <laughs> but also thank you to everyone because it's the, the chats and the comments and the, the things that, that really make any event what, what it becomes. Um, I feel like today has really been a, it, we've been building <laughs> because I think uh, things that were covered yesterday are being kind of more discussed today, conversations are building. And our idea for this last session was just to try to kind of wrap up a little bit and really focus on where we want to go next and what's our kind of going to be our priorities moving forward. I will admit there has been minimal effort, <laughs> very little time we're gone into actually planning this session because we wanted to see how things would go. But my suggestion is that we maybe consider these three talks, these three questions. Um, can you guys see that okay? So the, when I was kind of thinking about how we should kind of end this, we really wanted to as a group to, to think about the future and think about moving forward. And I think that we can think about this at three levels. What can I personally do within my own work um, to, to promote a more open, transparent approach to research? Then there's the kind of what, what should they do in terms of at an organizational, institutional, maybe publication level, a kind of more um, kind of higher level, higher macro level. And then finally, what can we, when I say we, I mean Stork, do to support these efforts and where should our most immediate priorities be? So this session can really be as long or as short as we want it to be. I think we can probably carry on with the discussions that we started in some of the, the others. But I think if anyone has a comment or a suggestion or a question on any of those kind of three, what can I, they, or we do to move things forward, please just stick up your hands, go in the thing and let's just let's just get some get some ideas together. John? Can I um just check so uh, one of the things I asked a, a question about um, uh, one of the talks earlier was around, I think it was Sam's talk actually, about are we going to write up some of these suggestions? Um, having been to SIPs and been part of their hackathon, it was really, it was, uh, many of their hackathons in fact, it was really interesting and important to have these kinds of conversation and use that as a basis of creating some kind of direction moving forward. So is that the plan from this that we're going to kind of reach some kind of consensus, maybe even after the discussion send out around like a, a working document for each of these kinds of key questions and see if we can pinpoint some kind of key areas that we want to target in on is that is that the plan or can that be the plan <laughs> <laughs> i think i can't speak on behalf of everyone i know uh, chris you mentioned that and i think it's a really fantastic idea uh, for that session and i think probably several other sessions virtually all of the sessions could be turned into a standalone document and perhaps uh, Zach, sure, uh, Matthew, we could talk about communications and kinesiology as, a, as maybe an avenue to, to promote them. But what do you guys think? Is there anything in particular that stands out as being, well, I think everything is worthwhile taking, uh, taking forward, but is there anything in particular you guys think we should focus on, push forward with? Not saying that this is the only solution, but um, you could reach out to the uh, speakers and have them summarize and then put it all into one document for some type of like a conference proceeding. And, uh, you know, depending on what the managing editors think, publish it in communications and kinesiology. It seems appropriate to me uh, as an outlet. Uh, or if there's more details about any specific talks and there wants to, uh, the speakers want to have a small working group or something, uh, they can reach out and submit that as a standalone manuscript um, with what they learned and uh, what they talked about and, and what they, where the discussion went as a um, direction for that. I think I perhaps misunderstood at the beginning. I think both approaches are great. I was kind of thinking more at the, the level of each individual talk, it being a, a thing on its own. John, were you thinking more in terms of an article summarizing the overall or both or, or any? No, no, individuals, just exactly like, um, so basically for each individual kind of 
talk not necessarily not all of them but perhaps or trying to try and, yeah kind of yeah lessons learned that, that we can kind of take forward um circulate that document around with the group and kind of get their input around um whether that, that was their interpretation because we often as speakers think that everybody's interpreting things in the same way but often they're not um and seeing if we can reach some kind of consensus can i start us with one idea just because i'm always that person sorry um the institutional one it just just kind of came to me that i was approached a couple of weeks ago from fergus guppy actually who was one of the founders of um one of the uh spot archive steering board he's just taken over as a head of uh program department kind of thing at a university in Scotland and he was wondering whether they could he wants to build his they're completely new brand new department he wants to build it around stalk fundamentally and the principles and was asking about potentially doing some kind of accreditation through stalk to say having input from us about the requirements of what what good research in sport and exercise science looks like and providing that kind of support to them uh, to help build that that program, build that that degree, and it kind of made me think, asking that second question about about institutional support, is that something that we could potentially do to provide guidance, to provide support, and potentially accreditation in some guys to actually support people that want to follow this kind of mission but don't necessarily know the steps to take or how to, I. I this is very much up in the air. I've got no idea how you'd actually do it in practice, but in principle, it's quite a good idea, I think, to, to offer something like that. Aaron, please. Uh, very interesting, John. Um, just a couple uh, comments or ideas kind of passing through my head on that. Um, one, I think that, like, I don't think that's something we could do. Like, it, it would take a very, it's going to take a very long time to put together something like that. And I think, like, we'd need, like a, a special committee, you know, to come together and put together those materials because like, you know, you said, you know, like what constitutes research, method, good research methods, like that's going to be obviously very controversial. So we're going to need a lot of input, right? Um, I don't know necessarily how prescriptive we'd have to be, but perhaps some overarching kind of some goals and aims for what that program should look like and give people the freedom and flexibility within it. It's, this is a broad area, right? You could fo you, you probably couldn't right. cover everything within an undergraduate degree in sport and exercise science anyway. Um, but it's about us potentially highlighting the key things right. that people should focus on or something like that. Maybe as a, a community, as a group, that we could do something like that to help. I, I really don't know. Yeah. Um, Chris made a good comment in there as well that it could be aligned with like an open access textbook type of series. Uh, the other thought process I have with that is like, you know how you're saying like, there's, I mean, you and me, like when we talked like sport archive and other things like with Stork, like we ripped from other people. So there's nothing new under the sun. Same thing goes with accreditations. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if there's any members in here that are part of like ACSM and some of like their accreditation activities, but we may want to get someone involved um, uh, with experience in that area. Uh, just so like we don't step in it. You know what I mean? Like, we may think it's a great idea, but you know, someone who's worked in the accreditation space can be like, "Hey, no, you don't want to do it that way because you're going to set yourself up for problems down the road." Um, that was my that was my other thought. I have, and I, I know of a couple of people that may not in the open science area, but they they have experience in that realm at least. Yeah, does anybody in the room like have a negative view of this? And be like, honestly, like it really doesn't matter if you do, because it's just literally an idea that's kind of popped into my head. So. It's better to have that kind of discussion now around like does anybody foresee any major challenges for something like that if it was to happen i, I guess I kind of like, put up oh. my hand there not by any means i think it's a fantastic idea and i think it could be really awesome my preference at least at the beginning would to be go more with a kind of uh endorse support rather than a credit version people will realize I did, anytime things come down to mandates and, and credits i tend to get a little bit and that's just me but I think at least initially, I personally would not feel comfortable in kind of, like Aaron says, this is the right or the wrong way. Who the hell knows what the right or the wrong way? But I do feel that more kind of endorsing and supporting might at least initially be maybe tread a little bit kind of more softly, softly to, to start all on board with, with supporting as much as possible. But I just wonder what do you guys think that maybe that might be... Uh, consideration but well, Zach and Chris I don't know whose hand went up first there but just hop in whenever Chris Zach, go. Can you go? 
<laughs> We're both too polite. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I just wanted to say that, um, at least for me in my university, whenever I've brought up yeah, the options to include certain open, uh, open science, open access, uh, statistical type things into the curriculum, it's met with immediate pushback because so you always have to cut something and we have to, our master in human movement science has to follow guidelines from the university, so it's all just so rigid. Mm -hmm. So this could be something very, well, not very easy, it's never going to be very easy to implement, but I think there will be national and institution barriers that might vary. So not a criticism, but just... Uh, it would be really good to have it in one place that could then be used as a model to help encourage others. Because uh, I think it'll be difficult to plan from the beginning for a more kind of widely applicable approach. Mm, great. So not that anyone uh, necessarily will want to do this for free. Um, there might be a cost associated with it, but I'm imagining initially some type of, uh, generally I'm in support of the idea, but initially maybe some type of um, workshop package to just help from both a teaching perspective, but also a research perspective. So in our uh, breakout room with the hackathon earlier, we were talking about um, meeting requirements from funding agencies and understanding those, but also maybe even just lab manuals of best practices. So we could go around and introduce those concepts to departments or um, universities that are interested. Uh, we kind of did something similar, not, not identical, with Vanessa and Aaron with uh, the University of Montreal uh, in March. And I, I thought that was a positive experience. Um, so there might be a cost associated with it or it could be free. But again, that might be a starting point. And then later on, um, I think Ymir was talking about uh, uh, endorsing uh, different universities. If different uh, departments demonstrated that they were having, um, I don't know, a certain percentage of faculty and students uh, adopt these practices and report on how they're adopting these practices, um, then we could highlight them in some way. Um, and, and that might be a starting point. Um, because Sam mentioned the logistical burden. Yeah, that would, this would be, you know, a full-time job to evaluate curricula. Yeah, no, I agree. I think, um, yeah, I, yeah, I don't know exactly how much or how little something like this would be, but it was just a, a primer really for uh, a discussion of, of institutional ways that potentially we could, we could do. Um, does anybody else have any other ideas? I think the, I'm, I'm going to get the, it wrong now, I think it's called the UK Reproducibility Network. But yes. They've got some some nice things in terms of they're putting on train, trainer courses mm -hmm. um, and that type of thing. And I think that could be a way to potentially reach a lot. I know Stock develops, a, as I mentioned, learning objectives, like kind of an outline, and then try to disseminate it out and create that exponential effect might be interesting. Yeah. Right, I'm terrible doing two things at the uh, thing. Any other thoughts on that? No. Um, I think as well, people were kind of let's go fairly informal here now. We were starting to integrate discussions uh, after say Nick's talk, Christie's talk, the discussions by led like, by Sam and uh, and Chris, um, the, the publications talk. If anybody wants to just comment on anything now, follow up on anything, I think now is a good time to do it. I know we're all pretty wrecked. It's been two intensive days with a lot of uh, <laughs> a lot of information, but I think now is a good time to just comment in general uh, about anything. So either just jump on in or stick up your hand if you see there's a few people um, wanting to, to, to talk. Just back on um, what, what uh, we were just talking about there about institutional changes to uh, support open science practices. It seems that um, lack of incentives is a, is a um, you know major barrier for a lot of people engaging in open science. When let's say the lecturer to senior lecturer, I'm talking uh, apologies, people across the pond where it's I think it's assistant professor and uh, and 
associate professor anyhow in the UK lecturer to uh, senior lecturer promotion criteria um, really you know promotes things like you know the usual H index and um, being author on books and stuff like that and perhaps you know pushing to have open research incentives uh, on that criteria um, at an institution, institutional level would be helpful. I wonder if that might become more prevalent now, um, like in the UK, UKRI, so major research councils are actually now mandating a lot of open science practices like data sharing and things. So I wonder if that actually will naturally then more, you know, will become uh, more relevant to uh, universities at, let's say, a faculty level to encourage you know researchers within that faculty to um, engage with their open science but I think having it on a uh, as just one thing on a you know on a multi-level promotion criteria um, would be really helpful not sure how to go about uh, changing that though you probably got it to knock on some big doors I'll, I'll piggyback on that and maybe maybe part of that is again having another i know i'm just like keep saying form a committee for this and that but uh but form another like committee to look at that and maybe issue a position statement on promotion criteria right like what we think are best practices and things committees should actually be looking at and should actually not be looking at like i you know the number one thing i would say is like we could start off at our our not things not to do do not count the number of publications when you're considering hiring and tenure and promotion, it's not a good metric. Bing, bang, boom, done, throw it out the window. Um, I think that could be could be really helpful as an initial step, but I don't know if anybody else agrees. Uh, Rosie does at least, so. <laughs> just, I think Zach's just mentioned Dora and I was gonna, my point was about, it'd be a really good start if we actually just held institutions accountable that have signed up for Dora, but then completely ignore what they've bloody done like if we was to hold people accountable in the first instance at my institution for example when i applied for my promotion application it was all of the stuff we've just described what's your h index what's the volume of publications you've done i'm like we're a signatory of dora like and they were like what's dora it's like this is senior management it's, if we held institutions accountable in the first instance for what they've actually signed up for it'd be a really good start without having to get them to sign up for something else I think I'm going to kind of piggyback on this and I should also probably stress I'm in probably a bit of an unusual position because I have like a research fellowship type thing I'm in Sao Paulo in Brazil but I haven't I've kind of stepped outside of the traditional way and I haven't had to align with um with a lot of institutional procedures so forgive me if I've been a bit ignorant but what I struggle with sometimes is and I totally agree with what you're saying there in terms of certain things and metrics that we should not focus on but how do we judge for it? Like, what should we focus on? Because everyone thinks their own research is great. Um, so like, how do you decide if we get rid of these other metrics? Chris or Aaron or whoever. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I just put a link because there's a big discussion in the Netherlands around this at the moment and their scheme is called recognition and rewards. And it's trying to deal with exactly these issues. Well, firstly, that. There are different types of scientists. It's not. Uh, it shouldn't be the lone genius that is prioritised and rewarded over everybody else, and uh, so stimulating open science and changing the reward structure and all these things. And there's a lot of discussion, but as you say, for some of these things, there's not a clear solution yet. Um, and one of the things that's becoming more common are narrative CV summaries. So instead of giving a big CV with a list of papers, you give a few paragraphs mentioning maximum 10 papers, you can't mention impact factors. So yeah, in some ways it can create other problems, but um, there's at least an attempt there. And I mean, I, I'm biased because I work in the Netherlands, but I don't know of a specific scheme that is quite as far in those discussions nationally. So it might be interesting for you to have a look at. We have some nice documentation on the website. I think that was uh, a really super interesting kind of forward and back. I, it probably was in the Netherlands then. A group of quite senior scientists came out saying that against the idea of taking away metrics. And while I was absolutely on one side of the debate, I could see points in terms of I think the more subjective you make an assessment, the more risk for bias to creep in and for 
myth <laughs> um, to because as, as I think it was funny said in your talk, two people can listen to the talk and take something different from it. Two people can read a subjective evaluation of the quality or the impact of, the, of somebody's work and answer differently and you're going to favor your mates. Um, so I think uh, let's, let's go in the order. Uh, so Vic is, was up, had raised his hand uh, and then Aaron. Yeah. Thanks. I might sound a bit sleepy now, but it's a very <laughs> interesting discussion. Uh, just um, uh, tying up on Chris was saying, yeah, recognition and rewards is big. And in my university and the WU Amsterdam, it's also getting big. And one of the suggestions that they have actually come up with is the, the valorization and diversifying uh, career paths idea, which is, which was not the case when I started my PhD. So for example, uh, there has been a lot of a push in uh, trying to like like impact or, or show impact or valorizing your ideas uh, uh, if from your research results, so for example, and there have been some suggestions like uh, if somebody is doing it, uh, you can also write a chapter on valorization in your PhD thesis, uh, which well, <laughs> I have uh, been in debates with again with my supervisor, but I think I have finally succeeded to keep it at, at least in the acknowledgements, if not in the main chapter. So I'm writing up in the acknowledgements. So maybe these types of things are yeah, or something that, that is coming up in, uh, in order to yeah, change the way a little bit of how these, yeah, how, how promotion and tenure are looked at. And yeah, I just wanted to add that in this discussion. Yeah. Thank you, Zobik. Aaron, I see you have your hand up is this on the same team or? Yeah, it was going into what Chris was saying with its eval, and I, I, I understand the, the risk for bias to a certain extent. I don't think there's no metric out there that I've been shown uh, is of any use whatsoever. Um, and so my thing is, as like a stats person, I love stats. I love things being quantitative, but let's not hide behind the quantitative <laughs> as a defense against not being able to evaluate something effectively. And I think that would be, if we were gonna write this paper, that would be a major point I would write home. Like if you're gonna use a metric, pardon my French here, but you damn better, better know and show that it actually does what it's supposed to do. Because if not, you're hosing people just because you wanna be able to hide behind a number rather than say, we don't like you. Um, big, big pet peeve of mine. And I would say another thing I would add to this and a big problem I've seen at universities is they're judging you against other people. And if anybody who's taken a measurement and evaluation course, you have two types of evaluation. You have normative and, uh, oh, now I'm gonna, now it's gone out the back of my head. Um, but normative and essentially meeting a standard, right? Are, are, you, are you meeting some minimum standard? We don't care if, if you know, professor so-and-so has published more than you or has a higher impact than you. Are you meeting a minimum standard for what we consider a tenured professor at this institution? That's it. And I think that's something that has to be considered when when coming up with criterion. Thank you. Good Lord. <laughs> Sorry, I give this speech all the time. I can't believe I I, um, I forgot criterion based measurement. Um, and uh, yeah, th that's like my my biggest pet peeve is you, is we probably need to get away from like the whole normative standard because then it just turns into a rat race. Right. Well, he published 20. Now I'm going to have to publish 25. Now I'm going to have to publish 30. Now do you get where, get where I'm going with this. Um, and, uh, universities also have to consider what they are, what are the criteria? What are they trying to select in for? Right. And I think right now it tends to be getting your name out there a lot and talked about IE impact factor and bring, give me dollars. Right. And those aren't necessarily, like, I think the latter one, there's, there's a good argument for why universities need to have that. Um, but, um, yeah, I, sorry, I'm just getting on my soapbox here of uh, why I think a lot of these evals are bananas. Um, but yeah, I'll let somebody else talk now. <laughs> We've got kind of parallel conversations going on here and in the chat, and I'm really terrible at keeping up with both. So, uh, um, anyone else got something that they'd like to, to mention or comments? Either on the, the kind of Whole, I think the whole evaluations, incentives, metrics is such a huge, huge one. Chris? Yeah, maybe just looking from a slightly different perspective, um, looking forward, um, well, the, the incentive structure is a big part of the problem. 
Um, and so, but maybe that's something that Stark can do. Like how, how could Stark incentivize practices? Can we do awards? Can we create attention using the platform and, and the membership so that people at least have something? For instance, if a PhD student says, well, I, I want to submit to communications and kinesiology and the supervisor says, well, it's not, it's not yet PubMed listed. People won't see it what can we give that student that they can then go back to the supervisor with saying, wow, well, but there, there's a chance for an award or that uh, they have 2000 followers and they guarantee to share every article or post a video clip or a video app, something like that, something that we can give people to incentivize and help uh, yeah, make it more accessible or more visible. Because um, I think that's one thing that is maybe uh, currently not so addressed, let's say. Um, and maybe going back to John's talk, I can definitely see that another peak in membership or interest in Stark will come when one of these journals is PubMed listed. Huge, and let's, let's crowdsource this. What can we do? Like the one thing that popped into my head there when you were talking, Chris, is at the moment, Jennifer could, uh, could could tell me much better but, uh, as a treasurer. At the moment, I believe that our membership fees, et cetera, cover like the costs of running the platforms, et cetera. If we could potentially tap into, start thinking about applying to bigger sources to perhaps a grant for a open science-based project or to, I think those types of things uh, would be quite useful. And I think going by what James Heather said yesterday, do you know anything bigger things cost money. Uh, so perhaps thinking of funding sources that we can tap into that we can then in, in turn pass on to, to, to create incentives might be a nice thing to, to think about in the future. And actually, if anyone does have suggestions of places to, um, to apply to for, for these types of things, pop them in the chat or send them on. One thing that I've been looking into, I have no idea if it'll be successful or not, but I want to try to find at least some funding support for that open access textbook, ideally to give each lead of each chapter uh, a, a contribution uh, towards writing it. It's not going to fully cover your time, but even something small, I think, max your time. So that's something is on my to-do list to explore in the next while. But yeah, anyone had suggestions on that type of thing? I don't know if it'll work out or not. Yeah. Just on that, I think, so we hear about incentives a lot, um, uh, certainly like monetary incentives for doing things. I don't know if it's needed a lot of the time. I think, obviously, it's, it's great if we can, but I think if you can sell a vision for something, if you can show the meaning for contribution that somebody will make, especially for something like an open access textbook, like Zach's much better place to, to advise on this than I am, but... I don't know, a small contribution to somebody's time when you're, you effectively kind of value their time at less than it is because that's all you can afford. Sometimes I just think it's better to just say, look, we're trying to do this thing because we're trying to make a, a meaningful contribution to, to society. We want to have this textbook that's openly available to students all around the world, regardless of publisher fees and all this kind of stuff. I don't know. I think, I don't know. I think you just get good people that want to help because it's a good thing to do. Um, unless you can afford, unless you can afford to pay people properly for their time. I don't know. I, I almost feel like it's a small amount. Like say you could say you could give somebody like 50 pounds, for example, for writing a chapter. Is 50 pounds going to make a huge difference to the individual? Probably well, not. Well, I live in Brazil. So <laughs> yeah. uh, Tony, I think is another Brazilian here, the transfer rate from real to yeah. time. <laughs> but I think that's a, that's an important point that I think actually me personally, I'd prefer to give up, and I'm probably weird, but I'd prefer to just give up that 50 quid because it doesn't really matter to me yeah. to help a Brazilian researcher have four or five times the amount potentially, yeah. like a contribution from that, because that, that's just a, I don't know, it seems like a, a better thing to do. Like, what's it, the, the, the isn't the, um, it's effective altruism, right? The organization that shows you how to like best use your money having a having a generic 50 pound payment for example yeah. for everybody different values different weightings it kind of it's about effectively using that money it to uh, input and influence the most in the most meaningful and supportive way go on zach so this is something we've uh, started to talk about a little bit in the exec committee 
Um, I don't know how reproducible the research is, uh, but there might actually be, you know, a backfiring effect if you uh, pay people, but it's not that much money, and then you add extrinsic rewards to it. But um, I was fortunate enough to have every contributor do it for free, and the total cost was, you know, less than a thousand dollars. But I also recognize that that's not ideal, right? If we could pay people, that would be even better. So. I do appreciate Amor's point totally, because it's a whole lot of work. Um, one thing we've been discussing, and we haven't crystallized this, so it's, it's totally open to input and I'm genuinely asking, but um, there are some platforms where you can um, offer your book for free, but then you can also have like a suggested price. So people who are willing to pay, then pay. Um, the problem with that is I don't know if Stork can then enforce that the payments are actually going to all of the contributors, right? If like 70 people contributed, then how, how do you organize that on an ongoing basis? Do you send quarterly checks for, you know, the 36 cents to each contributor? Um, so the, the details... I'm genuinely looking for advice on, on how we as store can facilitate that. So always offering it for free to students, but still having a mechanism for funding. Aaron, you had your hand up, is that on the same pointer? I was just going to add to it. It was with John saying, like, I don't think money is necessarily the main contributor. And I agree. Like, I don't think money becomes a real problem when it becomes like, until it becomes like a substantial amount of money. Like if we were offering people like, like if we were like able to get like a multi-million dollar grant to do a many labs like thing and people could have like their lab funded and a GA funded. Oh, pe people who have hated open science would be banging on our door to get in, right? Um, so I think like those smaller amounts, people are like, it's almost more of a hassle, right? Like, I mean, like there are times where like I do consulting and people are like, we can offer you this much. I'm just like, I I'm interested, just let me do it for free. I don't have to deal with the taxes. Do you know what I mean? Um, so I completely agree. However, I would say like on the other end, I, I don't think, I would have thought the altruism at this point would have attracted more people to the cause. Like honestly, like when I wrote that moving sport and exercise science forward paper, I thought like, I'm like, it's gonna happen. Like, you know, but it, it hasn't. And so I think a little bit of the, uh, the narrative I've given myself in my head is that if people who don't have money, they need prestige, at least in this area for scientists. And I think if you look over at SIPS, they do have that, right? Like you have like, I think it's Stephen Lindsay, who is the senior, like the editor in chief at SPSP. I, I think I'm saying that correctly, who is like a leader within SIPS, right? Everybody's gonna wanna join SIPS, be closer to him. Um, and so I think, you know, I, I don't know how we emulate that or try to sell prestige in, set, in the sense, or even if we want to, but I, that's, I think the other lever we can pull on. That's really interesting because I think, and I've thought, I, I think this kind of aligns as well sometimes when we're talking about journals and impact factors. I think we'll all agree impact factors are not a good, good metric. But there are several journals that have a high impact factor that are also very, very good. And there's, we have to, we have to make a decision as to where to send our things at some stage. And we have to decide how and people won't always agree on that and I think it's similar in terms of prestige some people attract a great following for a reason and other people attract a great following for more nefarious reasons and I, I, I feel like we've almost sometimes go too far the other way and we're like oh we shouldn't look for prestige we shouldn't look for high quality not high quality journals high impact factor journals but sometimes we have to consider that people have prestige for a reason and uh, it's, it's trying to identify, you know, who do you, what, what do we want to value the most and how do we decide and recognize that might be maybe very different for most. I don't really know what I was trying, to, I don't really know what my point was there, but that just jumped into my head. <laughs> I think again, if the, the simultaneous Anybody anything else with the, I think there's a lot coming out here and maybe on 
a lot of these things can probably be individual sessions um, in terms of following up on specific ideas or putting together groups. Um, but does anybody have any other kind of comments or questions or suggestions that they'd like to, to throw out while we're here? Nick? I'd like to just to briefly comment on this idea that I think there probably needs to be more work done regarding just general consciousness raising for the exercise science community at large. You know, you've got to remember that people who are attending this session are already, you know, self-selecting as people who care about this and who are willing to give up their time for free and who see it as an issue. But, you know, in a lot of the work that I've done, particularly on, on skepticism and, and critical thinking in health and wellness, I seem to get a reasonably good level of feedback and a lot of um, positive comments from people in you know, science and skepticism, but in exercise science more generally, uh, people just don't seem to be that receptive. I don't think people really realize that there's a problem. And if they do, I don't think that they, they particularly care enough to do anything about it. And I think um, exercise science is, is a discipline. I think we can probably all agree that is not known for really um being willing to air the dirty laundry kind of thing and uh, i think we people like to pretend there isn't a problem and so i think a lot of the work that needs to be done is to really just in in getting people to understand in the exercise community at large what the implications are of bad practice and getting people to understand that it affects us as, as a discipline it um it affects the reputation of exercise sciences it, it impedes our ability to do our jobs if we're working with clients and practitioners you know it can impede sports performance it has implications on clinical practice and so i just think um, maybe that the rest of it will come if we can just get more people to realize that there's a problem because everyone here already knows there's a problem but so uh, maybe there needs to be more consciousness raising more generally that's my two cents worth here's nick aaron you you're gonna I just want to piggyback on that and, and say I completely agree. Um, and Chris even says, do we need a BEM? And I thought we've had like in the past like five years, I thought we've had like five BEM moments. Like, you know, like where I'm like, this is the one, like everybody's going to freak out now. We're good to go. Like this is going to get the ball rolling. Nope, no one cares. Um, and I even, and to be honest, Nick, that's why when I kind of went after this in my PhD studies, like it's why I, we wanted to publish in sports med, like one of the highest impact factor journals uh, with the moving sport and exercise science forward paper. Cause I was just like, this will be it. Like we're gonna, you know, put a shot across the bow where everybody's gonna see it. Um, and I mean, we have this and the ball's kind of rolling but it certainly doesn't feel like it has uh, a great amount of momentum. So I, 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 any suggestions you have on that front? Like I, I'm all ears. I mean, I think we're all all ears on it's just a matter of uh i don't know if uh, i i feel kind of out of i feel personally kind of out of ideas at this point thank you the... so i i concur with those points and i'm just wondering what are the avenues to raise consciousness that are not twitter or social media right i feel like for people who are on twitter and follow <laughs> our account and others, we are aware of this. But if I were to survey the rest of my department, there's varying levels of awareness, right? And investment in it. So what can we do to reach people who wouldn't normally be reached by us? Um, and that's a question to everyone. Aaron, you put up your hand there. I'll, uh, I think Zach, you were the one who mentioned the workshops, right? I think so. Someone did. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, but I think that's one of them, like, right. Like we can go to different departments and just maybe be a little bit more aggressive to be honest and be like, Hey, we want to give a webinar or a workshop to your department, like, or plant the seed with somebody within those, you know, cause we all have connections at different universities and, you know, go to that person and be like, Hey, like we'd be willing to do this workshop for you for free. And, um, uh, I think that could maybe make more of the connection. Um, I don't know how popular seminar is at other universities, but I know at Arkansas, like it was a requirement in the department to go. Um, so if you were to do it, say at like Arkansas, which if we're willing to do this, 
I will sell that. And it could, it could definitely happen there. Um, I think it would have a huge impact because all the students and most of the faculty would be in attendance and listening pretty closely. Um, that's, uh, that's what I was thinking as well. I, and I think uh, even Rose, or no, somebody mentioned this. Um, presenting at like, uh, like ACSM or some of these conferences, I think would be great. And maybe even we start like getting a booth at some of these conferences, just grabbing people and talking to them that way. Now, mind you, again, there's a cost associated with that. We'd have to, you know, kind of go in there being like, how much is it worth? Anyways, there's again, my two cents. Yeah. Fantastic, but bloody hell, they're expensive. I didn't realize to, to go in the expo center, they're extremely expensive. Just a very small point, but one thing I do think that we can probably focus on moving forward is, and again, it goes into the diversity thing, not just in terms of diversity of people, but diversity of subjects. I believe that people who work in sport and exercise psychology, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe this is more talked about probably alongside psychology, whereas maybe I'm wrong. I feel like if we have speakers from very different subject topics and then they tweet out, I know again, the tweet thing, but that it could slowly spread the word. Um, but I don't know. Uh, John? I think it needs, to, it needs to be multiple things. It needs to be a coordinated effort because um, we've, we've tried some of these things. We've tried them in dribs and drabs and the pandemic came along. I know somebody mentioned that earlier and it kind of put the kibosh on some of these activities. When we've done them, they've worked, um, especially longer workshops at, at conferences where people can self-select coming back to Nick's point and, and it's people that have some interest. Whereas if you go into a, a department and you have that, you try and give that talk, um, you might be talking to one or two people that have a bit of an interest and 40 people that have no interest at all. And are you going to change those minds in a 50 minute talk? Probably not. But reach go into events where you've got a thousand people or, or 500 people, you're going to get a bigger, bigger catchment of people that have some interest. And they're, they're the people that you initially want to bring on board and try and have a conversation with. Um, so I don't think going into departments will be, unless you're invited, Per, like specifically from a group that want to learn more. I don't think approaching departments, for example, and saying, look, we want to talk to you about this would be all that effective. I think you kind of, with limited resources, li limited people, you kind of have to go where you're wanted to a certain extent and wait, fundamentally wait for for that kind of critical mass to develop. It's not like if we had, we, we, we are growing, we've got more people now to go and have these kinds of talks. And it's great to see in the chats, people like Jenny and Chris, talking about delivering different workshops and things. And that's what we really want to try and encourage moving forward. And it will grow as we grow, but it kind of, you need the bodies, right? You need people to be at ECSS. You need people to be at NASPA and ACSM to all be saturating that message over that summer, really about the importance of these things, because otherwise it's too easy to, to ignore it fundamentally. So it's not, it's not, sorry, that's not a particularly positive message. It's kind of, time and go where you wanted really sometimes there's no harm to the outside selection i prefer to spend time with a smaller group of interested people than to kind of force in uh brad go ahead yeah i was just going to suggest uh from a really minimal effort standpoint um as reviewers we i think that we have uh, a little bit of potential there to influence people's future practices. I make a point of, of calling out, you know, would have been really nice to see a pre-registration. It'd be really nice if your data were available. I can't see your data, so I can't really review it. You know, it'd be really nice to have your code. <laughs> it'd be great if this was a preprint. Doesn't, I don't change my decision based on that, but I put it front and center in my reviews as a, a little bit of trying to do my part. Because I know a lot of people are quite responsive to, you know, reviewer two was really asking for this last time. I'm going to make sure I have it this time. And, you know, I think that's a minimal bit of effort we might be able to do uh, to just try and nudge things in the right direction. Lots of heads, heads nodding there all around the, the cameras. 
Uh, Chris, Chris made a good point in the uh, chat here of developing reviewer guidelines, um, which I think would be would be great. I mean, I, I, I'll even go a step further of maybe even like manuscript writing guidelines um, as well. Um, yeah, just what Jenny put in the chat, develop, like the same thing of like writing your own paper and evaluating papers. And um, I mean, I don't know if you've all read my big ginormous stats paper, but I got a lot of criticism on the length, but compliments on like, I actually had like these little boxes like with to-do lists and check boxes. And I'm wondering if some uh, kind of like a format like that of things to do. So that way people can just like, they're sitting there reviewing, they can have that open. They're like, yes, 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 yes. Um, could be somewhat helpful. Could I just remind everybody in the room that's having these suggestions that CIK is open to publishing tutorials. So if you wanna write a paper talking about how to write a paper, there's a journal there that will publish this. Um, so it's, it's, it's not wasted effort. If it wouldn't be wasted effort, but you know what I mean? You can actually get some kind of line on your CV that will hopefully add a, a little bit more weight than if it was just merely a blog post, for example, or something like that, or a Twitter thread. Um, we are open to, open, uh, open to publishing such tutorials. And perhaps something that uh, an idea that was briefly raised and that we, we kind of didn't really explore further, but we could revisit um, to the guys on publications would, what about the potential for having a, a kind of a summit special edition where things that arise from this come together, ideally with like we could have an editorial kind of given the overall view of what we tried to achieve, maybe a place to bring things together and have a, a, a target to focus on. Aaron? Uh, yeah, I, I would add to that, like if it's, I, I don't know if you're specifically talking about like the reviewer um, uh, type, uh, like addressing that, but I think like maybe with with that, like reviewer and publishing practices type seminar or workshop or whatever, uh, it may be worthwhile to invite other organizations such as um, the first one that comes to mind is American Physiological Society or American College of Sports Medicine, because I know APS is actually put on reviewer um, like training sessions. And overall, they've been rated very well from those. I, I've never attended one, but I've been told they're very good. Um, so maybe getting those other organizations involved. And I mean, I think that would go a long way in kind of selling organization to the more senior people if we could maybe even issue like a joint statement, like with ACSM, right? Like being on like, because I think us and ACSM and the people who run MSSC could probably agree on 90% of things when it comes to uh, reviewer guidelines. Right, and so bringing them on board, I think, would massively expand uh, our possible influence there. Just my two cents again, but I don't know if that's what you're referring to, Imer, or not. I don't know exactly what I was referring to either, but yeah, along those lines. Um, I was gonna say that we, I'm gonna kind of have to schedule here beside me. Officially, we've kind of come to the end of the time allocated to this. However, we have also said that we'll have a little time at the end to just sit around and chat. So um, I'm going to, oh yeah, we're still recording this. I kind of forgot about that. Bring this one officially to a close. However, anyone who is around, grab a drink, grab a coffee, and we can just sit on and continue the, the chats for another while um, for whoever's available. Obviously time differences might, might change things. But overall, guys, I think it's been a fantastic couple of days. Thanks so much uh, to everyone. And hopefully it'll generate some ideas that we can carry forward as we move forward. <laughs>